Welcome, my brothers and sisters in Christ, to this prayer at the close of the day for Tuesday, the 16th day of August, year of our Lord, 2022. I do pray this finds you well in this wonderful summer evening. Sound of the crickets or cicadas earlier. Uh, beautiful. My dog's barking at Lord knows what out there. Something that moved, all kinds of things that moved this time of year. Uh, I might have to go and uh, get him. Uh, if we, in fact, I'll do that right now. So you'll excuse me for just a minute. Okay, all apologies, uh, but he'll just bark and bark. We do have a no bark collar, but obviously it's not on him. And whatever's out there, he's pretty excited about. So, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. The Lord Almighty grant us a quiet night and peace at the last. Amen. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praise to your name, O Most High, to herald your love in the morning, your truth at the close of the day. Once again, we continue this evening with the daily lectionary, specifically the daily lectionary New Testament reading, which is from 1 Corinthians chapter, and not quite the whole chapter, just the first 23 verses. Am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are not you my workmanship in the Lord? If to others I am not an apostle, at least I am to you, for you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. This is my defense to those who would examine me. Do we not have the right to eat and drink? Do we not have the right to take along a believing wife, as do the other apostles and the brothers of the Lord and Cephas? Or is it only Barnabas and I who have no right to refrain from working for a living? Who serves as a soldier at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard without eating any of its fruit? Or who tends a flock without getting some of the milk? Do I say these things on human authority? Does not the law say the same? For it is written in the law of Moses, You shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain. It is for oxen that God is concerned. Does he not speak entirely for our sake? It was written for our sake, because the plowman should plow in hope and the thresher thresh in hope of sharing in the crop. If we have sown spiritual things among you, is it too much if we reap material things from you? If others share this rightful claim on you, do not we even more? Nevertheless, we have not made use of this right, but we endure anything rather than put an obstacle in the way of the gospel of Christ. Do you not know that those who are employed in the temple service get their food from the temple, and those who serve at the altar share in the sacrificial offerings? In the same way, the Lord commanded that those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel. But I have made no use of any of these rights, nor am I writing these things to secure any such provision. For I would rather die than have anyone deprive me of my ground for boasting. For I, if I preach the gospel, that gives me no ground for boasting, for necessity is laid upon me. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. For if I do this of my own will, I have a reward. But if not of my own will, I am still entrusted with the stewardship. What then is my reward? That in my preaching, I may present the gospel free of charge, so as not to make full use of my right in the gospel. For though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win more of them. To the Jews I became as a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law I became as one under the law, though not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. To the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people that by all means I might save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel, that I may share with them in its blessings. And that is 
the word of the Lord. So Paul talks at the beginning of this section here about his pay, about money. Um, and that is something nobody wants to talk about in the church. Uh, but we read texts like this. Um, it, we do well to do it. This is the word of God. Uh, Paul, now this is an interesting thing, and I, and I had not thought of it this way, but I went to a wonderful continuing education class just uh, right at the beginning of the month, the first couple of days of the month, first few days of, of August. And we were talking about this particular text, spent a lot of time in this letter in the Greek. And I never thought about this. You know, this is the front end of, of the ministry in that place in Corinth. And Paul, you know, saying the point, okay, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to come in and I'm not going to demand pay, although I could, you know, I, you know, I make my living from the gospel because of what something that's going on in the congregation. Um, and he makes that very clear. He says, but you know, I, I have the right to be paid. And he's probably, and that all I can say is probably, is laying the groundwork for the pastors that will follow the, you know, him, the apostle. And he wants to make sure that their needs are provided for. And I don't know that specifically, but it, it, it makes sense. You know, he is saying, okay, this is not the rule and the norm. And, I, and we do think about this. We talk about this as pastors. Um, sometimes in a lively way about, okay, you know, let's, you know, the, America is a post-Christian culture. Uh, and, and my observation is, is churches that, uh, I, you know, are successful, they, they're kind of like flashes in the pan, they kind of blow up and then the latest and greatest things come along. I guess that's a discussion for today, so we'll, we'll table that. But make no mistake, we just turn on the news. This is a post Christian culture and our neighbors are increasingly hostile, hostile to the faith, especially a church like ours. And we're not changing our doctrine. That's the first thing people uh, think. Uh, other churches or other people who who uh, run other churches think other confessions. That's a better way to say it. Think when their churches are to their eyes dying. Now remember, God says the gates of hell will not prevail against it. We have got to cling to that text. So anyway. Um, you know, we live in a post-Christian culture. The churches are shrinking. Churches like ours um, are, are, you know, we're not changing the doctrine. Sorry, not going to happen. Uh, and uh, because it's drawn from Scripture. And so, you know, I don't know what tomorrow's going to bring or the next day. I know the whole story that God has told me. I know what the life to come. I have hope, you know, the resurrection. Of course I do. But day to day, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I, I used to say you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago that, oh, that'll never happen. I've stopped saying that. I'm sure you have too. And so one of the things that we face as pastors is, you know, the, the, the burden, it, it's expensive to have a pastor. You know, uh, uh, I'm at a point where I don't have a family, so the health insurance is substantially less uh, for the congregation than it was when I had a family, but it's still quite expensive. And most of us work for our health benefits, right? Uh, uh, you know, retirement planning, for I have no plans to retire, but, you know, who knows what my health will do tomorrow. Uh it's expensive, you know, to have a pastor. You know, we, we, we have to have a place to live like everybody else. I, I'm very blessed. My wife has a profession uh, and a darn good one. Um, but, you know, you can't, what, what if I didn't have a wife who did that? Or I had a whole house full of kids that needed, you know, attention. And, you know, both of us working on that. Uh, you know, so we have these discussions as pastors about, okay, do I not take a raise? You know, the Synod puts out a thing every year about the, you know, the recommended pay scale for a pastor, and it looks at the local economy, um, you know, inflation, those kinds of things, years of service, although those aren't big factors. Um, uh, but, um, you know, we, we have these discussions as pastors, you know, like, well, should I, should I not? Should I not take a raise or just say, you know, enough? But, you know, I got bills to pay like everybody else, and I, I live well, you know. But a lot of it has to do with, with my family's situation, not so much mine. Um, it would be different if it was just me. That, that was going to be much different. Um, the uh, So I'm not sure that that's the solution, though, you know, based on what Paul is saying. You know, I, I never thought of that before, that this is the front end. This is, you know, him, you know, you know the church is just getting underway in Corinth. You know, so this is Paul dealing with the issues that, you know, in this fledgling of church, not, you know, the long-term sustenance of the church. I just never really thought of it that way before. Um, that we do a lot of things at the back end that don't really seem to really do much of anything. Um, the pastors become bivocational. I have no problem with that. And I've thought about that, that that day may come and it may come soon that I that I have to take another job, uh, you know, to, to uh, one, supplement my health insurance and, 
you know, make ends meet, you know, especially with inflation. I'm not, I'm not knocking anybody in the congregation. I think this is just the reality of life. Uh, young men are not entering the ministry because they know, uh, uh, one, it's a, it's a long education and there are very bright young men and, you know, they know that, you know, you know, nobody wants to have to jump from job to job to job or be spend all these years being trained to be a pastor and then realize that, you know, I'm only going to be able to do that for a few years. I'm going to have to find something else to do. Or I'm going to have to find something else to do anyway. So these men are just going into, this is all documented in our Senate, you know, the, the research that's done. They're going into engineering, you know, um, uh, becoming lawyers, et cetera, because, you know, they're very bright people. And they, they have significant options. Um, and so, you know, one of the things we learn from this is like, okay, the church, you know, we've all got to be prepared to, to provide for the pastor um, and make the tough decisions when they need to be made. And that gets back to like, you know, should we take a pay raise? Well, let's say I don't take a pay raise for 10 or 15 years. And this is my opinion. You know, there are pastors who disagree with me. I'm just giving you my opinion. Let's say I don't take a pay raise for, for 10 years or, or so. And, you know, my, my pay is flat. Well, one, that puts a burden on my family that many other people aren't taking. There are a lot of people that are on fixed income. And they get the little bump from the government that often isn't as much as inflation. But there's, you know, other people who are working and stuff like that. And then does it prepare the con congregation for when I, you know, I take a call somewhere else. I get called somewhere else or I die. I uh, called from this Valley of Sorrows. Uh, does it prepare the congregation for the reality of, you know, can we even afford a pastor? Uh, and so maybe it's, you know, we have those discussions while we can before the, dis the decisions are made for us. Uh, that's never very good. But it is interesting to think of it in that way. And Paul is flexing an apostolic muscle. He's saying, okay, you know, you know, the worker needs to eat. You know, the, they, the, the preachers make their living from the gospel. Uh, and he's saying, because of the situation in Corinth, I'm not going to do that now, but make no mistake, that is, the, that is what, what the church is supposed to do. Um, and again, whatever was going on in Corinth, you know, fine. But, you know, what he's saying is that this is not going to be a long-term thing, you know. Uh, and he's an apostle, too, so he's in a little bit different situation than a pastor who's there day after day after day after day. He comes in very quickly, uh, you know, uh, by God's grace, gets a church planted or growing, and then, you know, off he goes. And then the letters start coming in. It's like, oh, we got these problems, and that's, you know, what we're dealing with here, uh, you know, because it's a new church. Um, and they're like, well, what do we do about pay? What, you know, what, what do, you know, he's not even there, remember <laughs> You know, he's writing from somewhere else. Uh, so it's not like he's, he's not getting, a, you know, he's not getting paid right that right there. But he's just saying, okay, I made these, because this, you can imagine it. So, I, you know, I come in and, and say, I'm not going to take a paycheck. And then, and then, you know, the pastors that are come in and they're expecting, you know, how else, you know, how else do you keep the lights on in your house? Or do you keep food on the table? Unless you take another job. And uh, Paul says, you know, you remember that. I did that for a particular reason, and you are going to do this, uh, you know, because that's how the guy makes his living. Um, very interesting. It's uncomfortable for us to talk about these things. It's uncomfortable for pastors. We'd rather not. Um, it's uncomfortable for people to hear it because it hits us where it hurts, you know, our wallets. Uh, uh, and that, you know, boy, you, you want to you know, want to have some lively discussions at church. Now, they're not usually contentious, but when we start talking about money. Um, I mean, I've been grilled, you know, pastors are in this weird tax category uh, in the United States, um, and uh, we get a housing allowance, but it is, it's a, it's an on-paper salary reduction. I mean, it doesn't change my, my salary at all. It just, it, to the to the IRS, um, and um, it looks like, I, you know, they, re, they record it's what I actually get paid, but it says, well, this is what, what's actually taxable income because I'm in the special category of clergy. And, it, and it's all based on what I actually pay for the house and interest and principal like everybody else. Um, and then I get to take off other things like, you know, uh, candle wax and really, and, and, uh, and, and cleaning supplies and stuff like that and telephone bills and stuff. Um, it's a special category for pastors. If it'll ever change, who knows? Um, it, my taxes are like this thick. But anyway, um, you know, I remember having contentious discussions because they, you know, who can grasp that? It's, you know, I had a study so I could know how to speak intelligently about it. And people, you know, of course, are rightfully concerned. Well, what is, is this legal? Yes. The, actually, I have to do this, you know, because the, con the, con the congregation actually has to vote on that. Um, it has to be recorded in the minutes. I don't get to assign a number. I ask the congregation, I said, this is the number that will work for me. And they say, okay, but this still has to be talked about in the congregation. So you can imagine, you know, this kind of bizarre concept of, 
you know, clergy taxes trying to explain to people, and they're like, you know, money? What? You know, it, it, it is quite interesting. So, and this ends with Paul with this whole idea in mind, not not, uh, oh, we're going to make church different. You know, that, that unfortunately, it's this last part, I became all things to all people, so I might win some. Paul is not saying, go out and say whatever you want. You know, don't, you know, don't say anything that's going to offend people, so you'll get them into church. That's not what he's saying. You know, he's making the point. He's like, you know, you look at the community that you're in, and the way you, you, you speak to the community and interact with the community is going to be different, um, you know, depending on the community. So I have lived in a community where um, uh, the abuse of alcohol was a significant problem. And so in that community, in modern times, you know, I'm not, I'm not that old, you know, uh, in the 20th century or 21st century, alcohol was not allowed to be sold. All right. Yet there was plenty, plenty of it. But I, you know, in, in my Christian freedom, if you come to my house, I'll offer you a beer. Um, uh, I'll offer you a glass of wine. Um, you know, we'll enjoy ourselves. You can say yes, you can say no. It doesn't matter to me. Uh, no one's getting tanked. No one's getting hammered. We're just enjoying the gifts of the Lord. But in that community, all right, I didn't even buy beer because I didn't want somebody to watch me buy beer. Even though I could sit in my house privately and drink it, you know, but I lived in that community. And so I wasn't going to, you know, have beer and have beer cans in the trash and stuff. It just wasn't going to be a stumbling block. That word is not the word, you know. Just so I could do it. So, you know, too, if I'm in a, um, a community that's uh, uh, predominantly Jewish, you know, I'm not going to, um, you know, be offering ham sandwiches uh, when they come over, uh, you know, a non-kosher foods, even though I'm freed from that, at least early on. You know, if they become Christian, they can have the, the ham sandwich right alongside me. But, you know, you, you got to gain the audience first. You know, and you don't do that by exercising your Christian freedom you know, and then stopping their ears as a result of that. Now, this doesn't mean you, you, I'm not changing the gospel, I'm not changing the doctrine of church, I'm just saying, in my Christian freedom, I'm not doing anything sinful, you know, I'm going to not do whatever, I'm going to deny myself my Christian freedom, you know, in order to, you know, make sure that they'll at least listen to me. Um, that's what Paul's talking about here. So whatever was going on with him getting paid, and he does appeal for money, you know, a lot, he's not afraid to do it. But whatever needed to happen, you know, he makes points. Says I did this because it was necessary at that time. But this is not something that you Corinthians or any of us are going to do, you know, forever. You know, I did that at that time in order, you know, so it wouldn't be a stumbling block. Whatever it was, we don't know. Um, and you know, but it, but you're not going to do that, you know, forever. So very interesting text tonight. Um, probably a little drier than you know kind of we want but it's important you know that this is life in the church um and you think about it you know if you're and i think like i said I, you've heard, i've talked about it in church about being bivocational um uh, it's hard to know when to sort of make that decision um uh, i was concerned at the beginning of covid that i would have to do that by god's grace i didn't have to um and again i'm in this kind of unique situation where my wife you know has a, a very good profession but um that kind of weighs on me too uh, should I rely on her? You know, you know okay, you know, it's, that's a decision that her and I have made. But if I'm bivocational, uh, that means I cannot devote myself um, to the ministry the way I do now. Um, I think about things that would have to go because I just wouldn't have the time. Uh, and church, you know, and if you've been into a church, many of you grew up in churches in rural places where you had a two or even a three point parish, meaning the churches were so small. That uh, and it's further if you go into the very rural communities, even even around here. But if you go um, to uh, you know the west and the and the upper Midwest, uh, uh, depending where you are, this is considered the upper Midwest. So I'm talking about the true upper Midwest, you know, the Dakotas and things like that. It's a three point parish is not uncommon, meaning a pastor has three churches, uh, and you know vacancies are getting longer and longer because it's getting harder and harder to fill those. Uh, so you, many people are used to that, and you realize that, yeah, when, when you know, we have to have church at weird times, um, we can't do all the things because the pastor just can't, he, he can't be here for this, that, and the other thing, he's going to be here on this day and this day, but not this day and that day, because he's going to be there. And, still again. and also, it's very difficult for the pastor, because he's driving a lot, still again. so you get the point. You know, Paul is saying, you know, you're going to care for the ministers, and we're going to have to face those tough decisions before the decisions are made for us. Uh, Interesting.
very interesting and very, um, it's the word of God, you know, it's always thought provoking. So, uh, uh, anyway, I believe in God, the father, almighty maker of heaven and earth and Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Lord, now you let your servant go in peace. Your word has been fulfilled. My own eyes have seen the salvation which you have prepared in the sight of every people. A light to reveal you to the nations and the glory of your people Israel. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Lord God, Heavenly Father, strengthen us in these dark and latter days that we may stand firm against temptation and the attacks of the evil one. Keep us ever mindful of Christ's victory over Satan and over our sin. And help us um, to not fight with these evil spirits, but to, uh, to stand firm in your forgiveness and remember that you have already defeated them, for the power is yours alone. Be with those who are addicted and despairing, those who fall into temptation in the grips of, of these um, evil forces. For the tortured and the oppressed, strengthen them that they may stand firm in the faith that you have given to them, and turn the hearts of the torturers and the oppressors that they may stand alongside us and confess your holy name. And be with all of us each day as we struggle with sin and the various temptations that we face. Keep us ever mindful of your forgiveness and help us to stand firm. Heavenly Father, as always, we pray for those who are crying out to you, for Dennis, Dave, Sandy, Dawn, and our dear sister in Christ who remains hospitalized, Donna, Nicholas, Dale, and Mike, our dear friends of the congregation, Dave and Anita, Katie, Don, Marge, Jason, Carrie, Rowie, Bert, Billy, Joe, Dee, Dylan, and Josiah. Heavenly Father, place your healing hand upon them. Strengthen them by your spirit to cling firmly to the promises of deliverance, even from death itself, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Be with those who care for them, that they might be your instruments for their well-being, and bless their families as they stand at their side. All these things we ask in the precious name of Jesus, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Visit our dwellings, O Lord, and in your great mercy defend us from all perils and dangers of this night. For the love of your only Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, for Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day. And I pray that you would forgive me all my sins where I have done wrong and graciously keep me this night. Bend your hands, I commend myself, my body, soul, and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. And let me sing a little bit of this great hymn by Clement of Alexandria. Him, uh, he died in the year 220, um, uh, Shepherd of Tender Youth. Shepherd of Tender Youth, guiding in love and truth, through devious ways, Christ our triumphant King, we come your name to sing, and hear our children bring to join your praise. You are the Holy Lord, O oh, all subduing word, healer of strife. Yourself you did abase that from sin's deep disgrace you so might save our race and give us life. You are the great high priest. You have prepared the feast of holy love and in our mortal pain none calls on you in vain our plea do not disdain help from above O oh, ever be he our guide 
our shepherd and our pride, our staff and song. Jesus, O Christ of God, by your enduring word, lead us where you have trod, make our faith strong. So now when till hill we die, sound we your praises high, and joyful sing, infants and all the throng who to the church belong, unite to swell the song to Christ our King. A great ancient hymn, and a great hymn it is, Shepherd of Tender Youth, hymn 864. With that, my brothers and sisters, I bid you a pleasant evening. Thanks for listening tonight, and by God's grace, we'll see you tomorrow night. Good night.